Okay, thank, thanks very much uh, to the chair and the committee for the invitation to, uh, to be here. Um, as mentioned, I'm, I'm a researcher with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, which for those who don't know is a, um, one of Canada's leading progressive research institutes. We are dedicated to uh, public policy reforms uh, to, you know, in, in the pursuit of social, economic and environmental justice. Uh, and I there direct the Trade and Investment Research Project, which pools expertise and, and uh, researchers from like institutions and academics that are interested in Canada's trade policy and the international trade regime more broadly. So I prepared to talk a little bit about the, uh, the measures in the budget that are at issue here with respect to uh, the generalized, pre uh, generalized preferential tariffs. Um, but it, you know, the previous guest did a pretty good job of going over those, so I think I'll just kind of hit the major reforms as I could see them in the, in the Budget Implementation Act. So it, it appears as though Finance Canada is working on a plan to, you know, basically upgrade Canada's system of general preferences. Um, for example, amending the customs tariff to renew Canada's uh, generalized general preferential tariff and least developed country tariff until the end of 2034, and to update both programs, including eligibility requirements for tariff preferences to align with Canada's trade agenda and simplify administrative requirements for Canadian importers. Um, so, for example, the Finance Canada consultation document um, envisions a five-year review for all existing developing country beneficiary uh, countries uh, to determine if they need to be pulled from the list. The administrative simplifications proposed by Finance Canada include uh, remo removing limitations on the amount of non-originating inputs, like yarn and fabric, uh, yarn or fabric and garments, for example, that can be included in goods entering Canada under under this under these programs. Um, there's also plans, and, and again, these are just plans based on the consultation documents we've seen, um, to introduce a new GPTP+, plus, as we were talking about earlier, for developing countries that meet certain international standards on human rights, labour, uh, conditions, gender inequality, climate change, and there may be other criteria as well. Uh, the proposal seems to entail giving um, these countries LDC type zero tariff rates, or as was mentioned by the previous speaker, kind of in between the zero tariff coverage and the the regular uh, GPT scheme um, and maybe expanding the number of products that would be covered. And then there's uh, these transition periods that are envisioned uh, for countries graduating out of the LDC program, such as Bangladesh, Laos and Nepal in 2026. Um, and there's also, I think, a one-year transition period that was proposed for developing countries that are removed from the GPT um, for, for reasons, uh, you know, of perhaps economic indicators, for example, as mentioned at the, uh, at the World Bank. So I'll make three general comments on the proposals. I think first, um, these systems, um, as, they were, as they were envisioned in the 1970s, are there to facilitate industrialization, promote export diversity, and lower poverty in developing countries and least developed countries. And I, and I think that reforms to Canada's trade preferences should prioritize what is best for developing countries and LDCs, uh, first and foremost, right? So not primarily or not what's simply best for multinational companies, Canadian companies operating there, or importers, for example, in the case of apparel and retailers here in Canada. Um, the inclusion in 2003 of footwear and apparel on the zero tariff list of LDCs contributed to a jump in imports of these products to Canada. Uh, Bangladesh has significantly grown its proportion of trade versus official development assistance as a share of its GDP under these regimes. However, as the 2013 Rana Plaza fire demonstrated, this e economic development has come with a high cost for workers who still face atrocious health and safety conditions uh, and harassment when they try to organize into unions, for example. Um, so I think Canada's GPT reforms should seek to find a better balance between market access and worker rights, and I, I sense that that's kind of what the government is getting at in some of these conditions. Um, second, and related to this last point, the government should carefully study the effectiveness of its trade preferences programs, as the European Union did a few years ago, as the United States does on an annual basis, uh, to find out if or how they are affecting trade diversification and sustainable development in LDCs and developing countries. Um, we need a big picture, is basically what, I, what I'm saying here, of, of the problems in the current tra uh, trade preferences regime and how the reforms might help fix those problems, which is how the, how the EU framed it um, in 2018-2019. Um, third, new conditions on the GPTP Plus program envisioned by the government should insist on countries meeting core labour rights, including the right to organise, core environmental obligations and core gender-based criteria. Absolutely, but they should not be so onerous as to be unworkable or unaffordable for these countries. 
A strengthened and improved trade preferences regime should include technical and financial assistance from Canada for beneficiary countries to develop export strategies, climate adaptation uh, measures, uh, trade and trade-related infrastructure improvements, support, you know, customs process modernization, these kinds of things. Um, it's not a, you know, it's not a matter just to create rules. You got to kind of help countries uh, ap apply those rules at home as well. It might make Mr. sense Trude, for Canada. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but are you getting close to the end? Yes, of your I am very close to the end. Yeah, I apologize. Five I, I apologize. Okay. Um, just to say quickly, I think it would make sense for Canada to consider harmonization with the EU policy as a whole, right? I mean, there's a benefit to LDCs in this in the sense that it would be one set of rules, one set of conditions that would apply to different markets, both markets at the same time. It's less onerous. It's less complicated for uh, developing countries to meet one set of rules versus two. Um, and finally, I just think that we need to be clear and transparent in how decisions are made to remove or add countries to the list. You know, if, if it's just an order in council measure, that's fine. But I think, you know, you don't want it to just be a matter of lobbying from a company to get a country added or whatnot. There should be some transparency in, in how that happens. So just generally, I think that we got to think about the benefit of the countries, the uh, exporting countries first. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any, any questions later. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you.